I have to really give credit to the uh, Future Investment Institute itself or the FII number six. We have uh, three stages in one room. So adjust your seats and come this way. And then we have more to follow on stage two after there, uh, thereafter. So welcome to stage one. I was thinking about the inspiration of that video that was played there. And the simple point is, is that nobody can really argue with the fascination with space. But the fact that it's become big business in the last decade is an entirely different story. Uh, you heard the numbers there, $178 billion invested already. Uh, there was one Morgan Stanley report that was suggesting uh, in less than 20 years to 2040, we're looking at a trillion dollar business itself. Uh, but there are key questions to ask about, does it solve problems here on Earth? Uh, we know about the rare earth minerals and how important they are to the energy transition, for example. What can we find in space that fits into that equation? We have a fantastic panel here of three, and kind of speed dating, I would suggest, almost for uh, uh, 25 minutes, right? So I'm going to ask our panel to be very uh, direct. Anush Ansari is the Chief Executive Officer of the XPRIZE Foundation uh, and space flight uh, participant. It's great to see you. Daniel Golden, former NASA Administrator uh, and founder of uh, Cold Canyon AI. And uh, Alessandro Profumo is the group chief executive of Leonardo, which is uh, an aerospace company, but actually is very active in space. Uh, I've known Alessandro as a banker, so I think your two worlds, the past and the present, have collided, right? Because you need to finance the next stage uh, of uh, exploration. What I'd like to do with this panel is actually to get grounded on Earth, if we will, because if I had this conversation at the first Future Investment Initiative six years ago, I don't think there would have been believers that it was actually a reality, right? It was the, the startup phase, Anusha. Would you, what would you suggest you tell the audience what they should be looking out for, where the money's going beyond the kind of wow of space tourism, with the potential of space? Do you want to start there? And I think sure. we can do that question for all three of you, actually. What do you see as the potential? Why don't you start first? Sure. Um, so I was actually in the center stage a few minutes that. ago talking about how space got its start with a competition. And it was to do a mind shift because there was zero investment going into it from a, a private sector. And it was only the governments to had uh, programs to access space. And as a uh, tech entrepreneur, I've seen how entrepreneurship can uh, bring a paradigm shift. But the problem with space was access to space was very expensive. People had great ideas on what to do once they get to space, but getting there and getting their payload up to space was very expensive. And what has happened over the past few um, decades is the cost of access to space has dropped significantly and will continue to drop. And it's like the early days of internet. Once we had the new browsers, the businesses started flourishing. So I think there's opportunities for a lot of low Earth orbit businesses that will flourish. We've seen how Earth sensing and satellite imagery has already become big business with Planet Labs and companies like that. But the next is moving some industries up to orbit. So manufacturing, uh, harvesting clean and sustainable energy in orbit, uh, like uh, solar-based um, satellites and beaming them down. Moving manufacturing of certain things to space because what we have plenty of out there is energy, the energy of the sun that we know how to harvest. We've done it for centuries, for uh, not centuries, but less than that, but for the satellites with solar panels. And then it's cold, so we need um, you know, cold spaces for our computing. We can put data centers up there. So we can do uh, take things that are harmful on our planet up to orbit, and then also harvest resources in space and bring it down to Earth for us. Good. Uh, so just a quick follow-up, if I may, uh, Anushka. What role will it have? We talk about rare earth minerals, and I've been following it because I'm in the energy sector, right? Uh, and we would have to redefine it as rare space minerals, but what's the potential in that space? And then I'll, I'll bring other two participants sure. in. So there are lots of precious metals in uh, asteroids uh, that uh, can be harvested and brought back. Um, but in addition to that, uh, we can look at regolites on the surface of the moon, for example, as a source of energy. So instead of worrying about sources of energy on our own planet, we can actually uh, import 
energy from uh, either low Earth orbit or from the surface of the moon and, uh, and mine them and, and, and create new sources of energy. But the asteroids and titanium, gold, many different types of metals are plentiful in asteroids that we have been looking at how to mine and there are a few companies uh, attempting to mine asteroids and bring it back to Earth. It's pretty, it sounds like a sci-fi movie, <coughs> but uh, it's, it's a reality. No longer, it's reality, it's here. It's reality, yeah. Uh, Dan, would you say uh, space has the potential to solve problems on Earth in that respect? Like even, deal I've seen some of the modeling of like in combating climate change, the great reflectors and some of the crazier ideas out there, but uh, what's, what are the solutions? I'm not ready for geoengineering Earth. <laughs> There's a lot of work that has to be done. You don't mess with our planet. Yeah. I think that we're in for a major transition in remote sensing. Up until now, it has really been government-led, multi-billions of dollars. The technology is now ready. The space technology could detect groundwater. As an example, 16% of the people on this planet live in India, and India has 4% of the water resources. Much of it is underground, and in places it's being overused. With the access of space and using gravimetry, you could determine the groundwater and be able to control the flow. Ah. So there's going to be an incredible business, even in a down market, as governments transition to the private sector and all of a sudden we're going to get resources, prediction of natural disasters, prediction of yeah. earthquakes, hurricanes, tsunamis, uh, rivers overflowing. We just had a number of examples like that. And the technology is maturing to the point where private capital can now take over because the risk of technology development isn't there. And the impact on humanity on this planet over the next decade is going to be enormous and the profit making and the business making capability during this enormous transition for those that understand it will be wonderful. Interesting, I didn't realize the timeline was so uh, in front of us. You're talking about the decade, the shift of change in the decade. Within a decade, it's gonna be all commercial services and government will be stepping out. And there's one more thing I want to add the enabler is going to be, besides the technology, the ability to receive signals from space on this. All of a sudden, humanity with low-cost phones could get emergency services, limited voice, limited data, and now we've made information ubiquitous. And in the process, we've generated businesses but we've improved the quality of life for everybody. Oh, very interesting. Uh, Alessandro Profumo, I've always known you as a very practical businessman and banker, right? And Leonardo is, has a space division, if you will, for what Dan was talking about, space observation. Um, but when you sit and say, I gotta have this feed into my profit line, and you don't wanna jump into areas like a moonshot that's not gonna be a reality, where is the opportunity for Leonardo in this case, when it comes to Earth observation, solving climate issues, what are you putting your resources forward to? <clears throat> As we heard, there are many different areas in the space domain which are incredibly important uh, for us, but for the, uh, the communities as well. Uh, we are not talking of SATCOM. Satellite communication is incredibly important. We will have uh, an incredibly decrease of cost uh, for uh, utilizers. Uh, the technologies are completely changing. We are going towards uh, uh, constellation of satellites uh, uh, a, a low level, so it's a, a very different uh, concept and uh, we'll have secure and uh, available communication with the latencies that will be incredibly low pretty soon. Geo-observation is also incredibly relevant for defense, as we are seeing in Ukraine, but uh, as well for uh, uh, for instance, precision agriculture is incredibly fascinating what can be achieved with uh, uh, geo-observation because you can reduce dramatically the waste of water for irrigation or the utilization of fertilizers. So 
the quality of agriculture could improve uh, dramatically. We know that uh, water, as has just been said, will be one of the scarce resources in the near future uh, and is uh, very relevant. As uh, Leonardo, we are investing quite a lot also in, uh, uh, in orbit uh, services because uh, we can like or not, but there are thousands of debris, I would say millions of debris now, because uh, uh, have been launched more than, from 57 to now, more than, uh, if I remember correctly, 60,000 uh, satellites. Now only 6,700 are operative, the other are destroyed, and there are millions of debris, uh, very small debris, so to manage uh, the satellites when they are in orbit, uh, so uh, the space situational awareness is becoming more and more relevant. So we are investing a lot on that. Uh, so you're doing, I was going to ask a question on space junk, and this is what you're talking about, right? Yeah, this is, uh, the, the sustainability of the space domain is uh, incredibly relevant. I think as well in terms of regulation. Today there is not uh, a, a global regulation on that, so uh, people are launching uh, uh, constellation of satellites, of millions, of, not millions, thousands of satellites, but the space is not enough. So we have to understand how to manage that, and I think that the uh, cooperation of many different countries will become more and more relevant. So the policy issue is incredibly important. Right. Uh, as Leonardo, we are involved also in this perspective, uh, so we have a foundation which is focused on that, and we are working in terms of uh, understanding how to create a framework for uh, the space regulation. It's a different topic, but also the underwater regulation is uh, pretty similar to the space domain. Well, okay, so but let's are spend really a moment. similarities. Yeah, no, I was going to say, let's spend a moment on that, because I think it would be great to hear from all three of you. You're a NASA administrator, for example, Dan. It's not the flavor of the day to try to recreate a United Nations, for example. In, in my plenary session yesterday, we talked about the 20th century institutions that were built up post-World War II, right? The, United problem, Nations. the problem is that today's space is a sort of wild west. I know. So we have to understand how to manage it. Yeah, that's so let's, if you had a magic wand, if we, if we, where do we start? Do you want to pick that up, Anuska? Should it be regulated and how do you get global collaboration on the scale when people are actually competing for resources in space, right? Sure. Um, so definitely low Earth orbit or, you know, Earth orbit needs to be regulated. Uh, space debris is a big problem. Um, we're launching a competition actually with a few government agencies uh, regarding, um, you know, collecting space debris because it's very dangerous. But uh, for future, we need regulation that uh, puts the burden on uh, companies who are launching satellites or, or other objects to make sure that there is a self-sustaining mechanism built in so it doesn't create junk afterwards. Um, there are companies that are being launched that are doing um, servicing in orbit that will become sort of the garbage collectors, if you would, of, of space to make sure that things that are no longer in use can be collected, hopefully salvaged and, and recycled in orbit and then put back to use. Um, but regulation is important not only for this reason, but also um, the, the potential harmful uses of technology in space uh, can be a big issue, and we have the uh, Treaty for Peaceful Use of Space in place, but I think as these technologies evolve, it's not enough, and there needs to be more emphasis on that. Good. Is this a space war, if you will? Dan, I'm not trying to stir the, the <laughs> pot here, but we know how the U.S. and China are competing uh, on the technology front, and uh, even what you think is a simple application of TikTok has caught the ire of uh, Washington today. So how do we make sure that the frayed relations we, we see between the number one and two economies of the world uh, doesn't go into space as well? What are your thoughts? I, I have personal experience in this. I spent the lion's share of my career working to take down the Soviet Union. That's what I did. I ran a multi-billion dollar business that did exactly that. Three months after the Cold War was over, I was asked by the President of the United States, George H.W. Bush, go build a space station with the Russians. You want to talk about <laughs> a change in yes. three months. It, was, it wasn't impossible. We took 15 countries, we worked together, 
And that space station is up there for 20 years now. Not one scratch to one astronaut, not one loss of life, and it's bringing people together. And people from other countries are coming in. So I'm a glasses half full type of person. Hmm. And when you are pressed with a need, it is to nobody's interest to have a disaster in orbit with debris. It is to nobody's interest to start uh, Star Wars as we go mining. So I believe it is really possible. Self-interest is a driving force. And uh, my experience was incredibly positive. And I might say, while the situation is going on in Europe, the space station is functioning beautifully hmm. and people are coming from Russia and other countries. So if we don't over-exaggerate, if we don't get hot and sweaty and we think our ways through things, there's a solution. Interesting. Uh, Alessandro, you talked about this idea of, you know, to give a sober assessment as a company that's operating in this space. Uh, what provides the best opportunity for investment today as you see it? And does your medium term scenario of five to 10 years factor in the innovation we're likely to see? It's a tricky game, is it not, as CEO? I'm a little bit biased, but I think that the service area is the most relevant one huh. uh, because uh, it's an area where there are many new ventures. Uh, in order to produce a satellite is uh, relatively expensive and to launch a satellite is as well quite expensive. Um, we are seeing, uh, on the contrary, many, many new ventures of small companies on uh, geo-observation and all the services related to that. Um, I think this is an area incredibly interesting. Again, if you have uh, uh, not an incredible amount of money, because uh, uh, I do believe that uh, the private uh, players will be more and more important in the US, but there is a lot of subsidy by, Na by NASA. We have, to, we have to be aware of that. When uh, there is a launch of SpaceX uh, paid by uh, the uh, government in the US, uh, they pay a huge amount of money, by far more than a commercial flight. Right. So there is it's a sort of a, it's a trade subsidy off. which is going on. I, it's, I think it's quite it's good. It's not subsidy though, it's, it's an investment that they would have okay, otherwise okay. made uh, I, I themselves do, and it would agree. have been it's 10 a, times a, that. It's an investment, but yes. in reality if you transfer money. It's an money, investment. <laughs> I'm, 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 not, with you. I'm not complaining on that. I'm saying that is a way. No, but let's, let's define it, though. Way in order Where to does the subsidy begin and end, though? There That's is no that, subsidy. Uh, for instance, in Europe, we cannot have a, a similar situation. We are more fragmented. We have uh, the European Space Agency, which is managing uh, the connection. It's very interesting because in Europe, despite of the fact that uh, we are in, investing less, uh, spending less in, uh, uh, in the space uh, economy, we have a very high market share in the overall uh, space economy, which means that being uh, fragmented, we are very efficient. But again, I think that uh, the most uh, uh, challenging area or the most exciting area will be the service one. The service sector of it. Okay, yeah. so we're at the FII number six, right? And you double it to 12. Sorry, so if I can add one area which is very important is cybersecurity. Cybersecurity from Because space. all of us, we have to invest a lot in uh, secure communication for satellites. Oh. Uh, so uh, quantum communication will be very, very relevant. Uh, uh, light communication will, be key, will become more and more important. So we have to invest on that. It's very, we're seeing that to play here in Ukraine and Russia, even with, uh, I think Russia would be surprised about how aggressive the surveillance has been, right, during this period of time. It's a very different warfare, which I think space will have a role in. What I was suggesting, say we're at FII 6, but say roll forward in 14 years, right? FII 20, which I'm sure it will reach as a milestone. What would, should we expect in the next decade and a half, Anuska, in terms of progress? So we're sitting here today, and this is almost like early frontiers, the Wild West, as Alessandro said. Can you project 14 years out for us or not? Um, I think so. Um, for sure, I believe that uh, we will have privatized space stations, so we will have orbiting stations uh, doing different types of activities, a lot in research 
and then hopefully eventually in, in manufacturing. Uh, but we will also have a permanent base or at the beginnings of a permanent base on the surface of the moon and uh, using again for research purposes, but also early stages of new businesses of how to extract resources from the surface of the moon and, and set up a base for uh, launching toward Mars, because I think that would be the best way we can uh, gain the experiences we need uh, to be able to actually establish an, and uh, a permanent base on Mars. That's quite a bit of, uh, uh, of change there. How about yourself, Dan? What do you think in 14 years? And I'll go to Alessandro. Really simple, 14 years from now, the governments of the world will be doing the core technology development and all services will be coming from private capital. It will avoid the necessity for subsidy so the governments will have money. They won't get into production anymore. They'll be just doing the research yes. and private capital is going to create incredible wealth. But the most important point is we're going to be at 9 billion people in 14 years, and those people need services, and those services are going to come right to their personal phones. But even more important than that, we will have solved the problem on humans living in space. Cosmic radiation rips apart your DNA, and right now it's not possible to stay in space and come back and have a healthy life for more than three months. That's wow. just about the breaking point. So the research that's going to be done, private public research, is going to enable astronauts to live in space. There have been a number, if you take a look at the new biology, some of the leading biologists are talking about making a radiation resistant astronaut, eliminating osteoporosis. Now you think about the impact back on the Earth so the space cadets want to live out in space, but pragmatists need to make money and pragmatists need to take the benefit of that and bring it back to Earth, because when you bring it back to Earth, you multiply the revenues and profits by an order of magnitude. That's what I see for 14 years. Wow, interesting. Alessandro, last word is yours. Can you, are you projecting uh, 14 years out for Leonardo and its role? Can you do that at this stage? Sure, uh, we are investing a lot also in uh, autonomous system. Autonomous system will be incredibly relevant in the space domain. So because uh, uh, we will have to work there uh, uh, <coughs> without uh, human being. So this is uh, uh, very important. Uh, I think that I want to spend one word on human capital because as we heard from our debate, uh, there are so many competencies that are needed for uh, the space area. I think that the human capital area is uh, incredibly important. So uh, to think, all of us, uh, which kind of people we will need in order to manage in 15 years from now, the space domain, I think, is very important. So all of us, mainly in the companies, we are doing a lot of financial planning, technological planning. We are not always uh, having the right human capital planning. I was going to say that. So I think that uh, we have to invest on that quite a lot. It's an incredibly interesting area. And also, we have always to remember that when we talk of young people, um, space is incredibly inspirational. And since, uh, at least in Europe, but I'm sure uh, in many other countries, we have a problem of gender balance uh, on the space domain, I think that space can be incredibly attractive for women. Uh, and uh, we have to leverage on that in order to have more women working in the STEM area in order to be sure that we, we leverage on all the talents we have. Good. I'm we have so to glad I'm not the one on the panel talking about this. <laughs> so we have to re do we have to rethink, Anoush, uh, STEM, STEM training? How do, you th how do you rethink that? We only have 30 seconds, so you have um, to be pretty brief. I, I mean, education system needs to consider why women drop out at early age in elementary school and high school all the way to college. Uh, Middle East actually has done it right because a lot of graduates of universities are women in tech. So um, I, I think we can learn from that. But their consideration, the way women like to um, experientially learn things versus just dry uh, textbook, I don't think anyone, any young person likes to 
go through the system of learning that we have today. So a major overhaul, which started with COVID and learning, uh, e-learning has already started. We need to build on it and, and take it forward. Yeah, we need to adapt as, as fast yeah, as personalized possible. Personalized learning. Anusha Ansari, Dan Golden, Alessandro. I'm going to make just a quick comment. The best uh, I, I think I was out of time. What are you doing, Dan? You don't work in television. What's going on here? I'll take a few <laughs> seconds. It's okay. Yes. The way it happens... They're screaming in my ear, Dan. I'm just joking. Go the ahead. The way it happens is not with planning, but you just do it. Say that again? It doesn't happen with planning. You just do it. Um. I had the privilege of appointing the first woman commander of the space shuttle. Everyone was worried what's going to happen, what's the attitudes. She was in charge. She did the job. Eileen Collins was brilliant. There was a major problem on that launch. It was fractions of a second away from a loss. It made no difference. She was a woman. Wow. We got to get rid of worrying about the barriers. men, women, yeah. and that's the issue. You don't have to plan. You just do it. Do it. Very good. Thank you. So, you took the extra time, but you actually gave me a great segue, and thank you for doing so. So Anu Sansari, Dan Golden, and Alessandro Profumo, thanks very much. I'm going to introduce the next guest. Could we give a nice round of applause to our panelists? So thank you very, very much. Nice to meet you. Thank you.